For those who are remote, we're going to Okay, for those who are remote, we're waiting. Okay, we're going to wait two minutes to see if we can get the, uh, the audio and the, the video going, and then we'll go ahead and get started. Just on this, but um, the presenters might change the thing. It's just a chair. Testing one, two, three, testing one, two, three, testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. <laughs> testing, 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 testing. Oh, just saying they can hear it. So for those who are remote, can you hear us? The chair is okay. Okay. So they're saying they can hear us fine, um, but it's just the yes. second screen. I think I need my echo. Would maybe some wire swap or something? You can For those who are remote, can you see the slides being projected that we can see here in the room? Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Okay, so we're trying to get that fixed for those who are remote. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it looks like it's being stretched right now. 
I thought maybe the dip board was a lot more accurate. I got one. I'm sharing the screen. So the, there's a remote report that they do see the screen moving. Okay. We're just, just, it's just not being reflected here. Yeah, I did this. I'm sharing from this laptop. But it's just not coming up there, but it is coming up online. That's the one that displays, right? I don't know. This, this, this controls the second display. Oh, yeah, so we're, we're not. So oh, no, no, sorry, the report is they can see the share, the screen share is starting. They cannot see the screen. They're getting it. Right. They're getting it. Right. <laughs> so, so they need to see that one. Yeah. So this is what they can see, which is just that second screen. Yeah. So, uh, so, so they need to see, they need to share this screen. So I'm, I'm sharing this screen right here. Right. So what I think what's happening is he's sharing the one that's on by the wall. <laughs> Not the they need one. to see that one. Yeah. You're seeing what's on the top of the wall. Correct. And you should be seeing what's there. Correct. So we need to go into maybe this. But what's interesting is that laptop. Oh, there we go. Okay. Yeah, it's just a setting. Yeah, setting. A setting on the browser. But now we're seeing the same thing. All right. We're getting close. Yep. We got it. Yes. Okay. Go. Thank you. You want to drive this drive? Okay, uh, we're going to get started now. So welcome everybody. This is the uh, RATS uh, session at IUTF 114. Uh, just a uh, note that we're uh, up to note well in terms of uh, just, just a review of, of what the IT uh, rules are for participation in IUTF. I think everybody's familiar with this. A few meeting tips uh, as we get started. So we have uh, uh, both in-person and online participants. And so as a reminder to the in-person participants, uh, just to make sure that uh, your, um, you know, when you're using Meet Echo to make sure your mic and your video are, are muted and turned off while you're in the room. And those uh, who are participating remotely, make sure that your, your audio and video is off unless you're the one that's uh, presenting information or speaking. And uh, use of a headset is strongly re uh, recommended. Uh, here's a list of links to the various information that we'll be reviewing today. Um, uh, important, uh, most importantly, is the uh, you can follow along with the meeting materials. Uh, just, just follow the uh, the link for the RAS uh, materials, uh, and then <clears throat> we'll also be taking minutes. We have a need for another a second notes taker. Uh, so, volunteer? Jeff. We have? We've got Jeff. Oh, we have Jess. Okay, and great. Gary. Gary. Okay. <coughs> so, Jess and Gary, thank you very much. For, for those who can also help in Ottoman, if I can hear, you guys can look at the uh, head shop. It's live. Yeah. So, just follow that link at the bottom. Okay, just as a reminder for code of conduct, essentially uh, be respectful and courteous to everybody here. Um, make sure your discussions are impersonal and uh, uh, focus on you know, participating uh, for the sort of broader good of, of the global internet and uh, encourage your participation. Thank you. So our agenda today is outlined here. Uh, Sorry if I could 
Yeah. Sorry if I could just jump in. Folks are reporting from the remote that the mic is very, very quiet. So maybe a little louder or kind of a little closer. I'm trying to heat it already. Or I can stand up there. There we go. Is this better? Away. Away. Okay. All right, so let's do an agenda bash. We actually have a fair bit of open mic time at the end, um, but uh, based on uh, the agenda here, is there anything that we should have on the agenda that isn't? Okay, <laughs> we can deal with that. All right, so. Thanks for the heads up. Yeah. All right, so let's uh, jump into the first presentation, which is going to be Eric Voigt. Hey there, I'm going to go mask off so you can actually hear this. All right, what's that? All right. And All right, so uh, go ahead into the slides. So it's just a brief update on event stream subscription. Uh, hopefully the slides will appear back on the other screen. <laughs> I'll talk through them as we get going. The first slide as this comes up is just the same thing we've shown in many uh, IETFs for the last couple of years. that talks about the relationships of the drafts, the relationship between the architecture draft, the relationship to the reference model draft, and the relationships between the um, chara draft, the subscription draft, and, and R4C. Now, th what the slide's gonna show when it comes up is that we're, we have the architecture draft, as you guys know, going through various reviews and it's progressing well. Uh, we have a dependency on chara, and chara is now through uh, to the RFC editor's queue, I think, and that's moving fine. Uh, next up uh, is subscription draft, and I think it's about to come up right now. The subscription draft pretty much is uh, ready to progress now that we have a stable architecture, we have a stable uh, EAT draft, and we're also basing it off subscriptions from the NetConf working group, which is going right next door. And what we're gonna do now is just, we need to write up some information in the security considerations text and then it's ready for working group last call because all the other parts I think are stable at this point. And, um, and that's pretty much a summary of where we're at. There's not been a whole lot of progress as we've been waiting the closure of the dependent elements. Um, and so uh, in the next months or so, uh, hopefully we can get the security considerations read, put out to everybody and then they can uh, go through and do an, a working group last call review, I hope. I think that's where we're at. So without any slides, I think that was the summary of the subscription draft. I can keep on moving unless anybody has any questions. I don't think there's anything very controversial about it unless I'm missing something. Have we had any uh, people review the draft? Previously, uh, that's how we got here. We haven't had any real reviews in the last, probably almost uh, six months or so. So uh, certainly it's very welcome to have as many reviews and many people jumping in as possible. That'd be great. Yeah, so this is Hank. Um, yeah, so the review, I think most reviews have been done on the Yang side, of course, because it's a Yang module. So um, there are some tooling issues. So if you see errors, these are okay, unless they are not okay anymore. But I think <laughs> <laughs> we will establish this on the list twice that uh, it's a local tool chain problem and not a problem with the actual Yang module. So don't be scared by that. Um, having said that, um, yes, security considerations is one of the uh, last open topics, so to speak. So maybe polishing and updating those. Uh, we could trigger other reviews that are not security centric, though. Uh, yeah, I, I was going to ask, can we benefit if I triggered or if one of the chairs triggered any Yang issues? Because I think we're going to have. Please, that would be great. Yeah, exactly. That that, that's what I was hinting at. Perfect. Cool. Okay. That would be awesome. 
All right, so in the interest of time, because I know we're poking at slides, I'm going to give the R4C uh, slides from memory. Um, basically, R4C is also progressing. Uh, there have been a number of dialogues that have occurred for various areas. One of the big things that's been happening is outside of the working group. And we have uh, Dave Taylor, who's in the room right now. We're hoping to get some stable uh, terminology out of the Confidential Compute Consortium. And we're hoping to go ahead and update the R4Z using the terminology that's been discussed over in the Confidential Cons Computing Consortium. We don't see a, a need to rush to get the closure until that's closed. Then we'll update the draft there. So that's one of the things we've been trying to do with R4Z. Second thing we've been trying to do with R4Z is continue dialogues with the eDraft draft on a couple of different topics. This includes things like security level, which has been sort of going back and forth for a long time, as people know, following the, the group. And uh, one of the things that has happened, which is a plus, is uh, we agreed, uh, I don't know how many months ago, maybe four or five months ago at this point, to include a, a couple different new hardware types in the draft in the next rewrite that match to some of the uh, CPE types that are uh, relevant to some of the use cases driving the EAT draft. So we still have security level stuff open, but we have been able to at least recognize that we need some more hardware types in the, in the uh, R4C draft. Uh, the last bit, and uh, I hopefully can bring up the slides for the last slide, <laughs> trying to get there. Um, there is dialogue um, going for uh, what is the right way to integrate with EAT. Uh, I do think that we're awaiting some of the disposition on some of the questions in there. We've proposed at least a skeleton for what it would take to put our 4 claims in EAT uh, syntax. And there was some stuff going in the last slide talking about what those syntaxes might look like. Uh, but we're going to wait on the closure of some of the other larger questions with EAT, which I'm sure we'll hear about in future slides. So with that said, I think I've talked about the slides from memory. I don't know if there's anything else people have uh, since they're not on the screen here, but open up for other questions if people have them. So my question is, have we gotten any substantive comments on this draft? Um, we've had a lot of comments early on. It's revved a number of times early on. In the last three months, it's really been, just been iterating on overlaps with the eat side. So I'd say that there are some real <laughs> now we're there. Um, I think there have been some substantive comments. As I mentioned, we introduced uh, or we want to introduce some new stuff as it relates to hardware types. There's been comments and iterations on stuff on the confidential compute side. They haven't been actual debates over sp single word texts in the R4C, but some of the base concepts have certainly been iterated in the last months. I see Hank waiting here. Yeah, so again, this is Hank. Um, yeah, that you, you mentioned the um, Confidential um, Computing Consortium. I think review from over there, it would be very appreciated. I think in the last half year, some of the problem statements converged. And as the CCC is relatively uh, application uh, fine, I would say uh, some feedback from that area uh, would be nice. But so. Yeah. I, we, we have to go to them, I assume, and, and yeah. just ask there. And probably the slide before this one is the one to end on, because that was kind of what you were just talking about, future integration based on, you talked about comments. We had the drafts that I look as, uh, to look for for substantive comments would be some claims in evidence and results threads and the e-profiles threads, which are very relevant to how do we determine integration over time. Uh, Dave Taylor, so this is on my reading list. I have not reviewed the latest document. I think I reviewed it when it was like draft zero zero or something like that in previous ITF. Mm -hmm. But um, so this may be answered in there, but I am one of the people that, yes, I will review this one and may in fact use it. My question has to do with the use of uh, profiles and what the current thinking is, if you can summarize that. So for example, in TEEP, TEEP defines a profile there because it has a relying party and the profile in TEEP says, here's what the relying party needs in attestation results. Um, how does that interact with what might be in the air for SI? Would you have a profile in here or would you say that this is a template for other profiles to use? 
It's a very good question. The question on profiles is a slightly different perspective for how we took the definition of the claims versus, let's say, the way EAT does the definition of the claims. We, from the R4C standpoint, take the perspective that the definitions of the claims will always be in attestation results, and they should not require a profile for any variation in the meaning of the claims. So we're hoping that where R4Z is used, they would be pretty much the same definitions as uh, used in any use case. In other words, they're not really varying their meanings based on the profile, or, so that you'd be able to pick up the claims in a particular profile. And that's the, uh, the prerequisites for, I guess, the next slide, which talks about design considerations. They certainly can be picked up by profiles. Um, and I have no problem with being picked up by profiles. I'm kind of waiting to see where the profiles discussion comes before trying to adjust any terminology against that. OK, so I just want to make sure I understand the answer that you're saying. The answer is uh, still a bit flexible if needed, but you see this is uh, replacing the need for other profiles for people that use attestation results, that you'd use this or some custom profile if this didn't work for you, you wouldn't try to use them both together and sort of subclass this or something. I think is your answer currently. Um, close. I'd say that there's a valid overlap uh, between the use cases of attestation results. And I don't think the definitions of the trustworthiness claims are flexible. If they're used, they should probably mean the same things everywhere. So it, you're not really worrying about namespace or other kind of discussions because the definitions are fairly fixed. And I see one question coming in from Lawrence, but that's that's my yeah. belief at this point with R4C. Yeah, because a, a, a neat profile does a lot more than just specify which claims they are, right? There's a whole bunch of other axes that are part of the profile, right? And so is your intent to dictate those there? Because the other variation would be, you take the claims out of this one and you use a different variation of like whether it supports the like detachable or whatever the term is, or the other variations that are in the profile. Yeah. Um, it, so that's what I meant by templates. It could be augmenting additional claims. It could be changing any one of those other things without touching the claims. Yeah, if you can go to the slide previous, I'll just close on this question. As you can see, when it's clear how profiles, we're gonna be very happy to add a section showing eat encodings. In that case, they'd be very open to be used in profiles. So I see no conflict for any of these claims to be used as claims. We're just waiting to see how profiles plays out before putting the text in. Yeah, so the, uh, the Lawrence Lindblad. Um, yeah, so the bulk of the uh, profile issues in EAT don't really have to do with refinement or meaning of claims. Really, claims shouldn't be varying very much at all. Uh, and we would like the definitions of claims to be sharp and broadly understood. So the, the profile really comes in, comes in because of variability in CBOR variability in choosing Seaboard versus JSON, variability in uh, COSE because of all the algorithms that, do, that you can choose, variability in JOSE because of all the variability there, and the requirement or non-requirement where, where it does really apply to claims, it's, it's uh, a prohibition of claims or a requirement of claims and possibly a refinement of claims, but really it's about a lot of the other stuff then than the actual semantics of a claim. This is really an EAT uh, question rather than an R4C question, so I'm happy to defer it. I do think that the meaning of a claim, such as security level changes, whether it's coming from an attester or an endorser or a lying party, and there's still a namespace question of how do you interpret uh, but, object. But uh, you, you, but you're, we're you're, getting into EAT here rather than R4C. No, no, actually, I don't, I, I mean, I think AR, uh, for RC also uh, has variable uh, syntax for encoding. Like you could encode uh, AR for, uh, I'm sorry, I'm saying it wrong. <laughs> you could encode that in Seabor or JSON or Yang and all that. So you could you could secure it with different ways and all that, right? So that's the, uh, just, yeah, yeah. I see the difference between encoding and namespace. And I'm asserting that the namespace is the variation here between different asserters. So hi, this is Hank. Um, just as a co-author, I want to make one thing very clear. These claims will never belong in evidence. Yes, never belong in evidence. So, um, I think that solves the problem. We can write that into the text very explicitly. I, whether the profiling would allow that, in theory. 
Yeah, okay. I'm just making sure about that. Anything else? Well, thank you very much. I see. Roast right now. There's, Was there, did you update? The there, right now, there's two entries in the meeting materials. We want to make sure you pick the one with V2. Uh, Michael uploaded them yesterday. It's just that the V2 one have more information on it that we need. It's the actual words to talk about. So, all right. So, uh, I say, I guess since I'm speaking, I'm allowed to take the mask off, right? Okay. Now I can breathe. All right. Uh, all right, so I'm talking about the RATS architecture document. Uh, while we're getting it up, I'll just talk to the title slide while I'm delaying here. Um, whenever there's actually issues to discuss, we had uh, Tuesday morning meetings, and we had a long list of people that showed up at various types of meetings and stuff. Some of them are in the room, some of them are remote. Um, a couple of them are co-authors, but I think we probably had like 15 people, not necessarily on the same meeting, but collectively discussing the various issues. Um, that were specific to this document. Uh, so we had issues and pull requests that have changed. Okay, here we go. Yeah, that's the stuff I was just talking about. You can see all the list of names on the left. So we believe the design team uh, being people that show up at the meetings to talk about the specific issues, right, is on the left there. Um, that is, of course, not working group consensus. That's confirmed on the list, but this is the set of people that were involved in presenting what's the dot, what was in the, coming up with the text that's in there right now. Uh, all right, so you can go to the next slide. Um, this has already gone through AD review. It's gone through uh, one or two rounds with uh, Roman. Um, among other things, here are the things that have changed since 113. Um, most of them are editorial things that, uh, including you know, some actual wording suggestions from Roman, which we thought were great. Um, the uh, the uh, uh, non-text version now has the nice SVG diagrams, right? So you have some pretty printed diagrams, uh, which you'll actually see two of those on the slides. Um, we made some minor adjustments to the terminology in terms of the definitions of things to be uh, more clear. An example, uh, we changed integrity protection, which was also a section of heading, to the term conceptual message protection, because it's not just about integrity. So those are examples of things. All, right. All those are minor editorial. There's no technical differences there, really, other than maybe some clarifications to, to say what we meant about those technical things. So go on to the next slide. Okay. So there's only one remaining issue in the AD review before things go on. Go on. Okay. And this is split between two slides because it's in discussion on two different diagrams. And this is a long ways away from this mic. So I need to be able to see one of these slides so I can uh, point to stuff because there's some small print in the, di in the diagrams there that people remote can see, but not local. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. Okay. Yeah, that's probably that. All right. So the uh, little speech bubble there is uh, Michael's kind of how we think about things, but the, everything else on the slide um, that's up above in italics and the diagram is literal in the document. Okay. And so, um, and I know Roman is here, right? And so I'm going to kind of summarize this and Roman can correct me because I'm trying to channel what Roman said and then kind of our discussion about it, right? So the diagram there, we see this is the uh, passport model diagram. And it shows an attestation result line coming down to an attester and then an attest attestation line going to the right over to the relying party. Okay. And Roman looked at that and said, well, that looks like the attester um, uh, does something with those attestation results. For some definition, it does something, right? And wanted to have more discussion about that. And so the text in italics is actually what the document says uh, about that diagram. Okay. So it says, the attester does not consume the attestation result but might cache it. Okay. In other words, there might be a time delay between the line coming down and the line going to the right, where it's just an opaque blob that's cached in, in storage and then sent off in, uh, at, in an appropriate time. Uh, the attester can then present the attestation result and possibly additional claims if that's encapsulated in some larger message right, um, to a relying party. Would, but of course, those additional claims are not in the attestation result. The attestation result is signed, can't be modified. It's an opaque blob to the, to the attester. Right. It com which then compares its information against its own appraisal policy. The attester may also present the same attestation result to other relying parties. Right? So it's an opaque blob. He's got this ticket that he can kind of present, just like a human hexa has a passport. You can't modify your passport, but you can go to one airport, you can present it, you can then go on to the next airport, you can present it, and so on. Okay? So that's what this picture is trying to describe. Okay? That is uh, cached there as an opaque blob, and then you can show it when you try to get entry into uh, various relying parties. So that was the intent of this text, okay? 
Um, and what and so that's why the line isn't just a pass through it actually stops there because it can be cached can be modified but it can be cached and it can be then be represented to different relying parties over time as this opaque blob okay that's what we're trying to accomplish with this diagram and with this text okay so now the question is um whether roman whether you think or anybody else in the working group thinks that additional text changes are necessary to convey that concept Okay. So we're trying to explain why that line terminates there with that text right there. So this is what, what the current document says. Okay. Yeah, yeah, please go to the mic. Because uh, our goal is that by the end of this meeting, we want to be done with this document, right? So this is, that's why I said I was going to take at least five minutes. So Because th this slide and the wording on the next diagram is really the only things to talk about. Yeah. Hi, uh, Roman Gianelli. We're talking about my comments. Yeah. Uh, I, I get that there's multiple semantics that we're talking about here. My read of section four is that you that that text is primarily the statutory definition of the information flow. I think perhaps a happy compromise mm -hmm. of the text in section five and section four is not to change the text in section five, which is talking about the caching behavior and the rest of it. Perhaps some text at the end of section four is to explicitly say, this is about documenting you know, the, 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 what our producer and kind of consumer behavior. That does not, it is, that's not intended to constrain the fact that I guess arbitrary rats elements can share stuff as long as they're not consumer considered production producers or consumers. So if I understand right, you're saying you have no problems with this section, but there's a section that comes before this, which I have on the screen or right, section four or whatever, that you're saying that one could be more clear. Would adding a forward reference to say see section five for more details of what the how of how it's used or well, I, I maybe guess the first thing I uh, guess I'm checking is my understanding correct that yeah. arbitrary rats elements can pass the thing as long as they're not considered the producers or the consumers because that's my read of what that architecture uh, is in, in, in a sense yes in the same sense as a router right so just like routers pass packets without knowing what the payload is so sure. yes and that's because um i mean that the reason i say yes that's talked about in the document where it says all oh, the roles and the conveyance mechanisms are conceptual right you could have one of the other roles that's an intermediary in any of the lines here when you're actually designing a protocol Right. You could have some other role that is actually an intermediary in between these lines here. Well, that doesn't affect the architecture. That's just a protocol instantiation that says, oh, yeah, it kind of bounces off this one as a router kind of thing. Um, and so it doesn't preclude that. It actually allows that elsewhere. So that's why, yes, to your answer, because it's consistent with other statements in the document that say that. The conception of the message goes between these. And here the attester is involved only in the conceptual diagrams because he's actually allowed to cache it and have multiple different aligned parties go out the right. And so that's not shown in the diagram because it will complicate it. And that's what that text is that's, uh, that's the bullet right above the diagram. It says, yeah, there could be actually multiple lines to the right for different aligned parties at different times. OK, so let me try it again. So I was operating under the impression that the, the architecture elements of rats were defined by what they produce and consume. So you can say, what do you produce and consume? And like, then you understand what the, what the thing is. The, what I'm hearing is yeah, that there are true. additional communication semantics or behaviors of those boxes that do not necessarily, con that they can be done by kind of everyone. Uh, in a sense, yes. Yeah, so I guess perhaps. Right. But, but, but you're right about the fact that, uh, that the, the def when you said about the definition part, yeah, that is absolutely correct. It says you would not call it evidence if it's actually consumed by something other than the verifier, right? If it was actually consumed and parsed by uh, a relying party or whatever, it would never be called evidence. And so in that sense, yes, you're exactly right in saying that the producing and consuming is part of the definition. Yeah. Yeah. So again, I, I'll go back to what I said. I think yeah. the, the fix for this is leave five as five is. Yeah, and in yeah. four, I, I think I would I would benefit from additional language that says something to the effect of, you know, consume or produce actually means this. There's there's this definition and that's what mm -hmm. we mean by that. And then there are other ways in which that can be passed, which is not produce and consume. And that's in scope for yeah. all, all the elements, no attempt to constrain. And, and C section five for, for, for specific ways in which you know some of that might occur. Okay. Yeah, that would work for me. Okay. Um, yeah, this is Hengen. I think Roman just said it. Okay. I agree. Okay. I don't know if uh, a, a note taker probably couldn't have captured that fast enough. We'll probably have to go back to the recording to see if we can capture some of that 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 wording or whatever. Okay. Um, so next slide. Now we're on the second diagram. Basically the same kind of comments in the second diagram. So here's the, the this is the diagram for the background check model. Okay. And ooh, look, you notice the pretty printed version of the of the diagrams here. Okay. Um, so here, 
um, you have the attester and you see the, the evidence line goes over to the relying party and there's a little curvy thing that goes through it and then goes up to the verifier. Okay. So now, this one is drawn a little bit differently and that's because the text below it have a little bit of different considerations. It's not because it's not the case the relying party takes that and then presents it to different verifiers. Right? So that concept just doesn't occur here. So the, the lines are a little bit different because the, 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 the way things are maybe, you know, cached or whatever a little bit different. So here's what the text says. And this model, an attester conveys evidence to a relying party, which treats it as opaque and simply forwards it on to a verifier. So in the sense, it really is more like a router, right? It, it, it doesn't do anything with it. It doesn't even say anything about caching, right? The verifier compares the evidence against its appraisal policy and returns an attestation result to the relying party. The relying party then compares the attestation result against its own appraisal policy. And the resource access protocol, that's the horizontal line there, between the attester and the relying party includes evidence rather than an attestation result, that evidence is not processed by the relying party, right? So the main part is the first sentence and the end of the last one, okay? So here it really is just a, just a pass-through, okay? And so it terminates at the transport layer, but so the end-to-end -end connection just goes all the way through it. And so that's why it's kind of curved straight through there uh, because it's more like um, in a routing sense, it's be like a layer two termination where layer three just forwards, right? That'd be the analogy here. Yeah, Roman Dini, I guess same comment, just to be very kind of explicit. I think if you have the, the appropriate caveat weasel words in section four that says, again, any rats, rats architectural element it can opaquely transfer the things that it has to kind of other rats elements, that would cover it as well. And if you want to talk about additional semantics inside the box, like caching the rest of it. C section I mean, five. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's kind of up to you whether you define that. I mean, think the, the key thing for me was making it really clear in section four that okay that is not the statutory information flow that's mm -hmm. the you're defining by what's produced and consumed as long as you define those it works for me thanks okay gotcha so the summary that i'm hearing is section five is okay section four we explain and i'm going to kind of up level what you said details are in that uh, that um section four says this is part of the definitions and the definitions are based around producing and consuming and other rats rules may be involved as part of the conveyance process for those okay they Oh, sorry, Thomas uh, Harjona, MIT. Uh, the um, I, I actually posted a comment on the chat. The same question. I think the word "convey" yeah. is too high level. That I mean, yeah, versus pass through, because because you're saying the word "convey" well, in, and "opaque." In this yeah. one in particular, yeah. it uses the word "forward" right in the first yeah. bullet here. Because right? then the "opaque" we don't use. Is, yeah, we use. Uh, uh, "Forward" when we mean pass through here, and so that one is the I, more. Specific. I understand what this means, okay. but just for, for the new reader. So just a quick process. Hi, Thomas. For those who are here live, if you can actually put yourselves on the queue in the media code so the people remember them. But it's fine. Right. Do we still state our name at the mic, given that we have to do that? Yes, we do. Okay. All right. I think so. I think that's it. So go ahead. I think you can go forward. But I think that was the last slide. So I think the last one is just any other question. Anything else that we missed? Because we believe that if we do this, we are done. And then it's past 80. I mean, we do this and then Roman pushes it onto the next stage as, as past 80 review. Right? So because it's already gone through like multiple working group last calls and everything. So all right. Thanks. Roman Dini again. Yeah, on the process finesse, it's an 80 review. So when we get the fixes here, we'll merge it. I'll put it into ITF last call. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Thanks, Roman. So by the way, I'm not tracking the agenda all that tightly, given that we have 50 minutes of take and make. So your your five minutes was actually 12 minutes, but it was productive. I'd say at least five. Yeah. <laughs> well, that, that's why I'm, I'm, I'm letting people know that, you know, the chairs are not following the, the time in the agenda it's because we're making good progress and we have to take these steps. Okay, I forget who was next. Uh, Laura, oh, Pete. Pete. So the, uh, the first slide we're about to see uh, describes the differences in EAT drafts 13 and 14 since the uh, uh, last IETF. Um, so really four areas, uh, some document reorganization that uh, I think should help make the document a little bit easier to digest. Um, the claim section, which had like 20 plus claims in it now is divided into four. So 
uh, one section for the nonce, the major section about claims about, about the entity. Um, then there is a section that are claims about the token. For example, profile is about the token, not about the entity. It tells you something about the token. Um, and then there's a section on including cryptographic keys in tokens. Uh, a couple of the sections were uh, moved to appendices. Um, so the core of the document now is, is uh, substantially shorter. Um, these were some uh, things about, there were really good discussions earlier on about designing claims and about uh, keys and uh, uh, endorsement and how that sets, sets up. So uh, they're not really critically normative. Uh, reading the documents, so they're in appendices now, but they were good work and I didn't want to lose them. Um, so that's the document organization. Uh, then in terms of actual changes to the specification um, uh, for uh, manifests and uh, software evidence claims, um, those are pluggable, meaning you can put a lot of different formats in there. Um, and uh, I switched to uh, co-app content identifiers rather than seaboard tags because of the uh, JSON support and other stuff. So. Sorry to interrupt you, Lawrence. The remote folks are saying that we're having some difficulty seeing those slides. Yeah, they're not. Specifically, they're not the Meet Echo folks. Yeah, we're we're still trying to work. Uh, Meet Echo uh, is having some issues, so Ned is close. Okay, I'm going to keep going. Uh, so that that was the you know the switch to uh, co-app content types uh, that seemed like a better solution overall um, for uh, the pluggable uh, software evidence and manifests. Um, so uh, we added uh, the SPDDX and Cyclone DX manifest types. Uh, so the ma the manifest claim you know it can be uh, a a COSWID or a suit manifest. Now it can also be an SPDX or a Cyclone DX. This is also pluggable, so it can be extended by other documents. Uh, uh, it just it's open ended. We I mean, you can't really pick a winner here on on uh, manifest type. So it's a general pluggable thing, and we have the specification for how to do SPDX and Cyclone DX. Uh, the measurement results, which is just describing the results of measurements, not the results of, of a verification. That claim was reworked and I think works a little better now. It's more general, can, can represent measurements of things other than just uh, software. Um, then uh, there was, there is a, uh, a profile added. This is kind of an example profile. It's also a, a definition of a standard profile. Uh, uh, an EAT profile specifically for uh, EAT devices, EAT constrained device, EAT on constrained de devices, so CBOR. Um, uh, I, I think that's the profile that most people are really looking at using for this. So that that actually says things like use CBOR, uh, uh, no indefinite length encoding, um, use uh, ES256. Uh, 384 or 512 for the algorithm and uh, uh, some things like that. So that uh, I think that will help the profile uh, issue a bit um, and give an example profile. Uh, so that's the specification changes. Uh, the CDDL is improved. Um, uh, you know, we had a discussion in, in uh, Vienna about where to define claim set and dependency on UCCS, that's uh, resolved by just putting a definition of claim set in an appendix in uh, EAT and saying that, you know, there's uh, other definitions of this uh, in other documents and, you know, they should all stay in sync. It's not a controversial definition or a difficult one, so I don't see an issue, issue here. I mean, that was based on Karsten's suggestion that it's fine to replicate CDDL. So um, then all definition of uh, UCCS is removed, but there is a socket, uh, CDDL socket into which uh, other um, EAT formats can be plugged. Um, and then there's just a, a lot of uh, CDDL improvements. It's, it's actually validating JSON and uh, CBOR examples. So the, so the examples in the EAT spec um, are all validated in the built document build process with the, the CDDL tool. 
And then there's just lots of wording improvements. The profile section was the biggest one based on comments from uh, Elliot. Um, I, I want to note there that one of the things I really did there was um, uh, make reference to what are almost profile sections in Cbor and in Cose. I mean, and there's actually documents, Cose uh, uh, documents that are profiles. I, I don't remember the thing, but they actually call them as profile, call, call themselves a profile document. Uh, Ned. Oh, okay, I see. <laughs> we switch switch screens here. <laughs> Uh, let's see now. Uh, yeah, I can't see my slides now. And Hank is in the queue. <laughs> That's a pocket dial. <laughs> I was just confused by there being no slides. I was like, yeah, maybe I should wait, and then I forgot. So um, uh, Brent and I were quickly exchanging on Zulip cool Zulip, by the way, um, that the phrasing in the EAT ID says, SW evidence can contain a suit manifest, but a manifest cannot be evidence. Okay, that sounds wrong. Yeah, so uh, so that's in it. I mean, so, I mean, I mean the yeah. dot EAT sounds wrong, not you, um, but yes. <laughs> I, I mean, if you get that in the notes or file an issue, just so I don't forget. Um, uh, and then uh, there was a bunch of, um, yeah, yeah, go, uh, I wasn't quite finished with the previous slide, uh, but mostly just, uh, I, th I think the profile thing was the main thing I wanted to mention here. The rest of it is just, uh, um, oh, the last, the last bullet there, the relationship of evidence to attestation results, basically can, you know, what it means to forward claims that are in evidence in attestation results. You take a claim that's in evidence, goes through the verifier and gets sent to the relying party in attestation results. So there's a, there's text in there that describes what that should mean and basically says, you need to understand the verifier's policy to know what's going on there. Uh, you can't just, I mean, it doesn't mean that, that uh, you can automatically trust those or, or that they automatically mean something. So, um, and that was, uh, again, an outcome of discussions at um, IETF 113. Okay, uh, next slide. Uh, so uh, this is, this is the, the work in the EQ. Um, I think the security considerations need some work. Uh, comments on that, please. Um, uh, I have a, a fairly large set of comments uh, on uh, the introduction and the abstract and some kind of higher level things that I haven't processed yet. These are some of these are from uh, uh, Elliot's review and from other other uh, comments. So I'm working through those. Um, then there's a bunch of other little inconsistencies that that I'm working through. Um, uh, so the, uh, I think those are all straightforward. Uh, I don't see any need for big discussion on those. Um, then uh, there's just two possible minor improvements that are kind of a, uh, standing open right now. Um, one is about the nonce. Uh, right now, it says nonces are absolutely required, um, but uh, there's the timestamp-based freshness that's in the RATS architecture, and it seems like each should accommodate that. Um, it's probably not a difficult thing to do. Um, and that would make nonce optional um, if you're doing the time-based one. So comment on that if you, if you think that's a good thing or not, or contribute a, a, a PR or not, or, or something like that. Um, uh, and then the other one is, since we have a standard uh, profile in EAT for CBOR, we might consider having a standard profile for JSON. Um, I think that was another suggestion. So I haven't made any attempts at, at writing that or, or know what that would look like, but uh, that was a suggestion. So that's it for now. <laughs> Oh, you beat me. Oh, they're just leaving. Oh, no. Okay. No. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, question on endorsements. There was a lot of discussion on endorsements and can they be delivered through a tester is unsigned? What was the disposition of that? So, 
I mean, EAT is kind of neutral to endorsements. But you can deliver from that after, that's after the discussion. Yeah. Uh, can I answer that as a question? Sure. Yeah. Here we go. Are you talking? Are, are you talking specifically about security levels as an endorsement? Okay. Um, I think I've said this before, but uh, but generally, is from a semiconductor manufacturer perspective in the ARM ecosystem for uh, for nowadays, not just ARM, but attestations generally don't treat endorsements the way the TCG does. So really, I want to make sure that we have our terminology correct. Are you using endorsements the way the TCG is defining it? Because the way I understand it, an endorsement that the TCG, as defined as TCG, and Ned, you actually posted this on the, uh, on the mailing list several months ago, is essentially a certificate provided by the manufacturer that a relying party can use in its assessment of an attestation and its assessment of the secure uh, the uh, security insurance of an attester. Uh, by the terminology, I'm, I'm not really trying to be strict to one or another. I'm just trying to figure out how do you deliver claims that really should not be generated by an attester. So I'm trying to find the logical way where things that can come from elsewhere are meaningfully delivered. And that's the open question that I, I didn't understand the closure of. Okay. Yeah, so I, I don't think I would call security the security level claim an endorsement. I, I, I haven't been thinking of it as an endorsement. Um, and I think there's, yeah, there were some email threads ar around this that didn't get settled. Um, and I guess we should take those up again to, to kind of really understand what endorsement means. Um, I mean, I, I, I know I've definitely thought some about that, but I've been focused on other details lately, so. That se seems a pretty important question to me, uh, what endorsement means. <laughs> We, we need to know the secure, and then we've got some. Uh, yeah, yeah. I just put it in the chat, please. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, um, <laughs> Giri, uh, I, I understand from the EAT point of view um, that is true, but as ARM is a co author of. Forum and they definitely do, do not treat endorsements like you just highlighted. I would not give ARM as an example here because I think um, ARM definitely uses or includes at least the definition of endorsement from TCG. It's, no, not a TPM from DICE, from Mars, from any kind of endorsement that goes with remote attestation in the world. So um, just highlighting that. Okay. So oh, oh, also, um, Dave, maybe get that. Um, this uh, action bunch. I actually wanted to come here because time-based freshness. There are few interaction models. Um, we are planning a, maybe a Nayana registry for. This is a very fresh idea from yesterday, and that might go into the uh, reference interaction model. So if you're doing nonce and time-based, you might also do epoch ID, and then you would be interoperable with this uh, IANA iterations of how to do things, and maybe Dave has something to say for that. Okay, so the chairs will be compiling a list of what we see as the open issues where we don't see uh, closure and working group consensus so that we can help make chair decisions on that to help this document progress further. Uh, we may hold an interim meeting soon, depending on the, the length of that, probably likely to be able to help process this more quickly. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I, I think Hank's comment we can cover in the open like later because there may be another minute on that where I want to comment on that, but I'm not going to do that now. Um, uh, I got up here to say that uh, I think the EAT document, uh, other than the work in the queue or whatever, um, I think the EAT document is okay with respect to their questions that have come up, meaning I think there are things that do not necessarily, I mean, even endorsements, right? Whether you can do endorsements in the EAT format or not, you don't have to change the original EAT, for EAT document if you were to say, I'm going to do an endorsement in an EAT format. You can do that. Um, so in other words, I don't think that that is something that will, in my opinion, any results, any changes here. 
that's not why I got why I put in my name in the queue. Why I put, put my name in the queue is to make the same point on a different topic. Um, one of the things that came up at the uh, hackathon is something that uh, Lawrence and I talked about, and we believe that the eat document is fine, and just wanted to report that out to the rest of the document. And this had to do with the manifest. Um, when or Lawrence talked about this, he said it was a socket. Okay. At the teat table, we came up with uh, a request to have a different type of format in the manifest, where the manifest right now says it's the entire manifest, not a reference to one. And we said, okay, gosh, it sure would be nice if you could have a reference to a manifest. Okay. But we said, this is a socket, which means you can do that in an extension document, which does not hold up the eat spec. So I just wanted to report out that I think the eat spec is perfectly fine, and we can do that in an extension. So I just wanted to report the discussion Lawrence and I were having with the rest of the working group. Thanks. Thank you. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Awesome. Okay, eat media types. Um, next, please. Right, okay, I will. Uh, okay, so this is a document that Lawrence Hank, and I have put together uh, to register a bunch of media types that are applicable to eat payloads. And this is in a separate document from the eat spec because at the time we discussed the topic on the mailing list a few months ago now, um, the fear was this would cause scope creep and delay it. And, um, and so we packed the definitions and the registration into this separate doc that has a normative dependencies on both eat and UCCS uh, without bloating those two. Uh, and the uh, main use case is uh, for, 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 for media types is, you know, the usual is you need to carry some rights conceptual messages, say your evidence or your testicular results using um, some type agnostic REST API that is layered, say, on top of HTTP or co-op. And, um, and you want your, your clients and servers um, endpoints uh, to be able to correctly tag their payloads um, and do do content negotiation and and whatnot and and you also want your brokers, uh, say your load balancers, your API routers, to do their job um, uh, without without having to snoop into uh, L7 too much, um, you know, and all this usual fun stuff. And as you can see from the picture, um, it has a quite rich type system and. Uh, Basically, this document um, creates a new media type for each of the productions in the grammar. Um, so you have the naked naked claim claim set claim set in a web token and the touch bundle. These are the three main things, and you have to times two those because each of them allows for either a CBOR or or a JSON uh, realization. So we have six new media types in total. Uh, next, please. Next, please, because and I have a table, yeah, exactly, with all the types and, and the names. So we have caught and jot, so we have the two debs um, and the two tagged claim sets, all under uh, the standards tree uh, with a type application and a nice subtype that starts with uh, uh, eat dash. And all, by, uh, all but the web tokens also have the plus JSON plus C for suffix and cotton jots don't because jot is not plus json and and we wanted symmetry um yeah next please right and and on top of that so we also define a media type parameter uh for the um profile this is completely optional so certain apis may entirely disregard its existence and some other may instead want to, uh, to to use make use of it. For example, as I said before, um, it can be used to pass the content um, of the eat profile claim to the upper layer processors while, while in transit, right? So to help the API routing infrastructure. Uh, and more generally, it, it, it gives you a scalable type system that 
in the, uh, fully mirrors the, the extensibility of it. And I've added a few examples in the next few slides, but we can skip over them. They are basically example about content negotiation. So um, next, please. Yeah, here is a successful negotiation where the client is submitting some evidence for verification. And uh, yeah, everything goes okay. So um, the the content type of the of the of the evidence is okay. The um, uh, attestation results format are acceptable, and therefore everything uh, is finalized with with the 200 okay. In another example that uh, is in the next slide, uh, again we're yeah here we have a the same client submitting evidence for verification, but this time. The content, content negotiation goes wrong. So you have 415 uh, support and media type report from the server side because uh, the, uh, con the the evidence is not in a supported format, and the server is able to uh, tell the client uh, uh, which which um, con media types are acceptable for for the service. And then a second example of failed negotiation in a, in an in the slide that follows this one. Please, Ned, if you could scroll. Yeah, this one, uh, if uh, the thing ends up in a 406 not acceptable because the um, uh, the client is requesting uh, the format of the decision results to be of a certain profile and, and uh, of a certain media type, and that is not um, um, compatible with the server side, which can then reply and say, no, can't do that, sorry. I can only do this and, 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 and fill the, the accept header. So it's, it's really that simple. Um, and so next slide, please. It's, I think it's the adoption. Yeah, yeah, so, so uh, the question is whether we the working group wants to adopt this thing or not. Um, yeah, so the question is for you, for the floor. So the question is, has anybody reviewed the document? Or not authors? So we'd like to have a couple reviews and then um, we can solicit feedback on readiness for adoption on the mail list. Uh, awesome. Mary, you, you were on the queue. I don't know if you had a question. I already argued for adoption on the mail list. Yeah. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Uh, Gary, my name Qualcomm. I have no objection to adoption. I think it should be adopted. Um, this, Thomas, this is a question for you. So we've, uh, at least in FIDO Alliance, we've done interops with the existing media types using it, each in its CW, in its COD form. And I've recommended that, I've recommended to the working group there that we stick to the existing media types in the case that there are um, uh, content filtering middle boxes. Um, now, are you planning to put any recommendations in this document as to when these media types should be used in place of the existing COT, JOT, and CBOR media types? That was not my intention. Uh, I think they are just, you know, we, we just uh, create these, these entries in the, in the registry. So if, if your API wants to use it, then use it. Otherwise, use whatever you think is better. Okay, but I think if there's some existing implementations that uh, if, if there's some existing implementations that uh, that um, maybe don't recognize these media types and uh, and and a tester is producing them, then, uh, then um, that may fail. So I think there may be some interoperability issues from that from that perspective. Uh, I don't know, Gary, because you know if you're using an API. You have to stick with the rules of that API. You have to know uh, what the you know the, the URLs are, what the media types are, what uh, what kind of you know interaction model you're 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 supposed to to use when when talking to that server endpoint. So I'm not I'm not sure it's it's the case that someone uh, an attester can just create um, evidence, wrap it in the media type, and send it over to a a, a URL uh, and Okay. And, the and other reason that this will work, you know. <laughs> yeah. Now, understood. Thanks. The other reason, uh, the other reason I recommended against it, um, though I didn't put this in writing, was if there are content filtering mailboxes, 
and particularly the dangerous ones that actually can intercept TLS connections, they may, it, it might actually be better to disguise attestations in a more general media type. Have you thought about that? So for instance, if the media type is actually available to the middle box, they may say, oh, this is an attestation media type. Uh, and if it's, uh, and if it's um, engaging in some, un some un undesired or unexpected behavior, they may actually drop it even though the attestation might be very important to the media, uh, uh, to the, uh, to the um, communication session. That's an interesting consideration, and I haven't thought about that, but I think this will, you know, become apparent when we use it. You know, I, we cannot say that it's going to happen uh, up front. We, we, we need experience. And if we say that, you know, in, in some specific uh, uh, environments or deployments, that is, is the case, then, you know, Given on based on on the experience, we can we can we can write something up and and uh, amend this. But uh, for the time being, I I'm not sure there's there's, there's sufficient evidence to 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 actually um, write this thing up in, in in the way that you put forward. Okay, we can consider for maybe later in the in the security consideration yeah, yeah, as, as you start to develop. All right, thank you very much. Cheers. Uh, the TEEP working group, um, the TEEP protocol now has a dependency on this document. Uh, and that's because it defines a neat profile. And it has to have a way of communicating that in, you know, content type and accept headers. And so uh, if uh, this could be um, expedited so that this could uh, actually get to RFC before the TEEP protocol, right? The TEEP protocol, I would say, is not imminent. It's stable, but not imminent, right? Then that would be ideal. Um, if for some reason this was going to not be adopted or take a very long time, we'd have to find some alternate approach in TEEP, which would cause problems. So that's why adopting this sooner or later is preferred from TEEP. Thank you. Okay, so we need to confirm to a call for adoption on the mail list. So, you know, we'll need several people, not just one, to support the... We need more, we, we need more reviewers as well. <laughs> So this is the thing, I know the two stores, but um, um, the working group call adoption is calling for review, right? So. It's a coincidence, honey. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, okay, this is Corim. Um, right, uh, we're back with it. Um, can, you, uh, can you give me the, the next slide, please? Thank you. Okay, just, this is just a refresher. Corim is concerned with uh, providing this info and data model for describing the kinds of rats conceptual messages that um, are known as endorsements and ref values. Uh, so this is the junction between attestation verifiers and the supply chain that creates uh, the attester whose evidence these verifiers are supposed to verify. Right, so if you look at the, 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 the yellow object there, uh, that's what Corim does and the, and, the, and the red arrows. The rest is completely out of scope of Corim. In particular, appraisal policies are not are not in scope. Um, so next, please. Okay, so we 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 presented Corim a couple of times previously, and and we asked for adoption, and the working group response was was pretty positive, but for. Unfortunately, ref values and, and endorsement were not in scope of uh, Charter 01. And so we had to update the Charter for, for expanding scope enough that supply chain provisioning was covered. Um, uh, next, please. So the, the good news is that now we have a main deliverable, two standardized interoperable data formats to declare and convey endorsements and ref values and a related milestone too. And uh, thanks to everybody for the discussion and for the big part push for, to get the update over the line. Thanks in particular to Roman for being instrumental in this work. Uh, so next please. Because in the meantime, we have published 03 uh, and that was a major re uh, revamp and, and uh, there was, it, it was, you know, there was internal triggers, but also the, the, the Carl's uh, well, its so review was uh, was uh, very important for us to, to push us in, in, in this direction. Um, we also have open source tooling that is available to anyone who has to play with it. Um, 
and it's of course a work in progress because the 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 the, 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 the format is, is a work in progress but we are starting to see uh, protocol extensions based on core and and and, um, and Carl's TAs, uh, which I think he, he's going to present next, is is the is the major example of that. And we also have application profiles built on top of core, in like the PSA endorsement spec. And I think maybe Ned can confirm that Intel is also working on something similar. Um, so yeah, obviously the, the authors would uh, would want to ask again for for adoption. And um, you know, now that we are clear to go, basically, we have no impediment from, from the formal point of view. Um, so I haven't reviewed this document before or since IETF 113, but I reviewed it when Hank and I talked about it before 113. Um, and I think I made this comment to Hank then and that I'm being consistent, um, that uh, I support adoption for the purpose of reference values. Um, this was previously not allowed by our charter or whatever, and now it is, I think. And so in that sense, I support adoption. Um, I am a little bit skeptical, given that I haven't read it, that it's actually appropriate for use for endorsements, okay, where I think something that is ETH-based is probably better for endorsements, but I don't think that should affect its call for adoption. Okay, But that's my, my constraint on the scope. The reason that I have a difference there is that reference values, the reference value provider is typically providing a set of reference values, like the following claim values could be any of these. Whereas in an EAT, it's typically a singleton that says the attester, here is the value. And for an endorsement, I usually think of that as a singleton that says this device over there that I manufactured has this single value. And so for that, I think an EAT format is probably more appropriate, but I have not reviewed the document to verify that right now. So I just wanna say I support adoption for use for reference value providers. Not necessarily, you know, regardless of whether it's used for endorsements, I support it for reference value providers, but endorsements is still a question in my mind. Thank you. So, uh, this is Hank, not belating the, the comment, just highlighting that um, we had a review from um, Microsoft Azure internal people using DICE, and they were like, yay. So, I, I think that's um, a good sign. So, it, it would be good if they could provide that feedback and comment. Yeah. on the mail list, yeah. right? So that's another one that we need more reviewers. So, you know, as chairs, we look for at least three reviewers to provide feedback, comment, you know, the usual questions of, you know, we'll need to review, interoperability implementation, and so on. So we can do that over the mail list. Cool, thank you. Oh, you were fast, Thomas. <laughs> The reason why we're starting to run the clock is I thought you were going to take 10 minutes. Was that it? Uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm done. Thank you. Awesome. Okay. We got Carl. Hello. Um, we'll talk about the concise TA store spec next. If you haven't read it, which I'm guessing is probably most, link is here. Um, editor's copies in that GitHub repo. And I did fork the, the Quorum guy's work, which was, was really good work to implement this. So that's available in my repo. Um, depending on how this draft goes, we'll see if I send a PR to, for considering to merge. Next. Oh, actually one thing on that. Um, it does include a, a command line tool where, where you can create structures from the specs. So with the JSON template, use that tool and you can play with it to a pretty good degree. Uh, next slide. What we're asking for is accept this as a working group draft and proceed on the standards track. Next. Um, you know, why did we do this? Um, Russ and I have a, a mutual uh, customer who's wanting to extend the CA to, to consider more stuff at, at verification time. And that stuff includes attestations. There'll be a, a draft presented at LAMPS Wednesday morning on key attestations, adding those to, um, to a few different cert request protocols. When you step back and look at this, we're, we're really implementing a verifier and the inputs to the verifiers are many and varied and the, the trust anchors are often though fairly tightly used and putting them all in a great big pile and giving them lots of scope is kind of sad. So we define this 
to represent trust anchors with some limitations on the context. Um, so next slide. So when we started out thinking about this, we looked first at the um, FIDO metadata syntax, since they do key attestations. If you look at that structure, it's a dictionary with attestation roots under keys that are authenticator IDs, which they don't call that out as a constraint, but it kind of functions as a constraint. We saw the presentation of Quorum at the last IETF, thought there was a decent bit of overlap. We set out to write this as a profile of Quorum, but hit some issues that, that led us to do it as an extension. So some of those issues are listed here. The life cycle of TAs and reference data is not necessarily the same. The use cases for, for trust anchors in our view are broader than uh, the use cases for Quorum. And then where the, the keys would fall in a Quorum structure is tied to comids. And we didn't really see a good way to bend that to support non-comid use cases. Next. So at the outermost level, the structure is an array. It's an array of TA stores, which is the structure shown here, which has an optional uh, language type, an op optional store identity, required environments, then some constraints expressed as purposes and, and permitted or excluded claims, and then the keys themselves. Next slide. So the store identity was the last thing added to the spec and that came after talking to the quorum uh, folks. This was included to allow other artifacts in a quorum to reference a, a TA store. So the structure we use here is straight from quorum. You can name a store instance within that array using a UUID or a text and with an optional version next. The environments piece um, attempts to, th th this is what's most roughly analogous to the FIDO authenticator ID, where, where in that case, there was a very narrow target to use to look things up. Here it's fuzzier. So we pulled in a definition from COMID, that's the environment map. We pulled in a definition from COSWID, and that's the abbreviated SWID tag. And that's really just, it's the concise SWID tag definition with all the fields made optional except for one. And then a, a free form text name. So next. In terms of constraints, you know, overt constraints, the environments are kind of a constraint too. Um, we have this EKU-like TA purpose where we list out different things you might verify with a trust anchor. We do have a draft written for LAMPs that we didn't submit before this IETF that maps all of these to OIDs. Um, you know, if this progresses, the, that'll follow suit. Uh, and there would likely need to be a registry for purpose values because this would need to be extensible. Next. Um, here we have just permitted and excluded claim values. Um, and that's just using the definition straight from EAT. Uh, next slide. And then keys. This is kind of the meat and potatoes. We require at least one trust anchor, and then you can include CA certificates if you want. The trust anchors, we define three different formats, um, a certificate, a bare public key encoded as a subject public key info, and an RFC 5914 trust anchor info structure. We've gotten an off-list comment that we should include JSON and CBOR formatted keys too, and that seems right to me. So we'll add that. I think just as a trust anchor expression, not to the CAs list, which seems appropriate, is, is just X509. Next slide. As far as security mechanisms, we inherit from Quorum, which uses COSE, and we add the extra to verify using a trust anchor that has the COTS purpose um, asserted. Obviously, somewhere back down this line, there has to be some out of band bootstrapping. Next slide. Things we left out uh, include how to use this stuff for verification. We have a draft written, um, it's not yet complete. 
Uh, next. And, and actually on that point, it's not altogether clear where, where some of the stuff should go because this spec sits sort of at an intersection between rats and lamps. So we'll, we'll see. Next slide. As far as high level questions in my mind, is uh, the quorum extension the way forward? I've had two voices on the list that, that support doing this as a quorum extension. Uh, I'm, I'm on the fence about how the environments are defined, whether or not we could squeeze out some common identity characteristics from the co mid and co swid instead of having the environment map and the abbreviated swid tag. And then questions, similar questions around the constraints mechanisms. Do they adequately cover what we'd want to use to set up these limitations? Are they overkill? Should there be something extra? And so forth. And that's all I had, so except for questions. So we've got two in the queue. Dave Thaler, thanks for presenting this. I didn't know about this until uh, the presentation here. So very interesting. Um, uh, if I understand, if I understand right, you're actually configuring the trust anchors themselves in a in the receiver. Is that That's correct? Right. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, so this is we have a need for this in more than just rats, right? So TEEP relies on configuring trust anchors. Suit relies on configuring trust anchors. So my question is, do you think that this work is actually specific to rats, or is this a more generalizable thing? And this gets to the answers to all the questions you have out there. I think it's more general. I don't know where the best forum for it is. We chose here yeah. because Quorum was the way that we chose to express this. Sure. Um, just it, if it's not specific to rats, I think we might actually reference and use this from TEEP, and we might actually be able to reference and use it from suit for which one of the co-authors is a co-chair. Um, and so um, I don't know if rats is the best working group for this, but I think it's very interesting work. So that's why I'm asking these questions. So. Uh, I may have a follow-up after Kathleen does. I, I was also unaware, Kathleen Moriarty as a, a participant, I was also unaware of the draft. I should have been aware. Sorry, I was not as tall as everybody else. Um, now, one thing, so I would like to follow it wherever it winds up, but um, in terms of like COSWID, how is adoption of that? Is that the right choice? Well, I mean, this is early days for all of this stuff, right? I so, just, that's yeah. why I want to raise it now. Um, so I think some consideration on what that format should be, if there's really adoption of COSWID or not, or is COSWID falling to the side in favor of other formats that are, are starting to pick up in well, terms of adoption? From a high level, I want to get across the keys and some means of limiting where they fit. Right, so yep. you don't leave trust anchors wide open like the web API, for example. Um, we don't have as tight of a target as FIDO, which is what we looked at, and figuring out what the right environment expression and constraint expression is kind of the work to be done. We took this shot. Um, if, I mean, we don't want to target things that, that aren't used that, that weigh us down, but, so I don't know. I mean, these are two questions I, I can't say that I could answer. Where should it be? I don't know. Is that SWID? I think is 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 used, but I don't know about CoSwid. SWID is used, but I think, and people who are at vendors, I am not at a vendor. I'm at Center for Internet Security. Um, it seems that other formats are picking up traction now, and um, this is it seems to be dying off, but perhaps a survey of that would be useful. So that's actually something my team might be able to help with well, um, that gets it, it, as the, a neutral entity. At the question here, could we, could we carve out some common characteristics? Maybe that's what we do. And then it could be used with a co-SWID or used with something else, but isn't overtly defined in terms of anything else. Right, so I don't have any answers, but I will offer, I, I have some interns that can help and we're at a neutral organization, so if, if vendors want to talk to us and help us sort through what what formats are, are being adopted we, we would be happy to compile that kathleen maybe it's called sure you to list your organization you introduced yourself but you didn't say your I organization did. i did say it center for internet security okay. well the good news is is that if you're going to call for adoption you said you want at least three reviewers so i think we just counted two 
and we already had one, so we might be in good shape for a, re a review yeah, account. Yeah, no, not yet, but I'm saying we, we have some interest to sustain the review. That's all I'm saying. Well, it gets to the question of scope and threats. Yeah. All right. Go ahead, Hank. So um, first, a lot of things, <laughs> unfortunately. Hi, this is Hank. Um, so first, I saw the CDDL. I already saw, I read the draft. Um, I see the high synergy and reuse of types and I see how that helps your work. So I'm absolutely fine with this being an extension of Coram, as a, speaking as a, um, one of the authors of Coram. Right. Because that is just there. And reinventing that would be like weird. And I'm happy that you find reuse in some of these structures. So excellent, thank you. Um, be it CoSuite or something else, I'm pretty agnostic to. Um, I'm very involved as a contributor to SPDX uh, for two years now. and. Uh, they just recently for the 2.30 uh, version uh, put in a pointer to CoSuit because P SPDX is not really good at being small. <laughs> and, and so they were like, okay, if you want to have small uh, file system references and such and uh, characteristics, you, you that can point to there. If you will go to this deterministic build, it's not interesting to you, you do Git bomb references. And so, uh, yeah, I think um, CoSuit is, has its place in the IoT realm. It's definitely going to be the part of uh, CoRIM, but um, um, as SPDX matures, and that is um, meaning 3.0, um, there might be a concise S bomb, and maybe we can look at that. But that is years. This is next year. So, okay. so that is there. That is very concise. There's no better, more concise way to go into the file system or anything else. So I'm happy to see it. Well, on that point, CoSwid yeah. just in the last week cleared. It's final hurdle, and that working group is actually yeah, closing, pushed. So, so that's so that's done. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, by the way. And then second close, curiously, no. Oh. Nothing else. Yeah, to the to the idea of, of the binding of this to kind of CoSuid, is there this idea that we can have format agility? And is that what you were thinking kind of with regards to abstracting what you want to do to provide that flexibility? Yeah, there may be extensibility points we need to add here and there. You know, uh, the, the keys already came up that way. And so there's probably a couple, couple of those. But I, I also don't want to have extensibility everywhere because then it's, it's I don't know. It, yeah. yeah. All right. Well, that's it. Thanks. Okay. So uh, I think what we can do is uh, call for interest and topics. I think there were some questions raised with applicability and, and COSWID, Carl. So we can at least do that. And as we said, there were at least two organizations and individuals that were willing to think, I don't know if you were also raising your hand to help review and provide feedback and comments. Okay, he nodded. So. And I'll post to the list once I know okay. if you want to. Okay. 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 No, it's, it's okay. called for interest. Okay. Yeah. Right. And we will volunteer okay. somebody to help with the assessment of the format. And so mechanically, know. how does a call for interest lead to a call for adoption and so forth i mean is that a progression i've not seen it's call for interest before it's a progression so, yeah, yeah. Okay. it's the first step yeah. and i'm doing it just because there was a question of you know is it broader should it be in racks and all so okay um wow almost on the money so nice next up simon hi uh, wave if you can't hear me. Yes, we can hear you just fine. Excellent, marvelous. Uh, first slide, please. <clears throat> or next slide, please. Okay, so eCollections um, is a proposal for a new an extension to the e top level object. And it's for use cases where there is no obvious or maybe varying uh, top level sign up. So currently, your 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 eat must start with a a CWT, WT, a dev, a a, a signed thing. Um, but the collection we we it came across various use cases where we don't necessarily have. Hang on, just 
of the bubble time getting horrible feedback. Um, we came across these various use cases, in particular with our work on, on confidential computer architecture, but also looking at things like, which may have originally been based on searching, where there is no, not necessarily an obvious top level signer, or it's something that can change. Um, so looking at the, um, uh, the search chain example, because this really is people. If you're trying to can, if you're trying to build something from something like a dice chain, the leaf or should be that last signer, uh, which would need to encapsulate the other things can change, um, or the number of items, objects within in the token can change. So your opportunity to take these down into sub mods um, is is quite constrained. And this is something we also ran across in uh, ARM CCA because the nature of the, uh, the signer can change by, um, by deployment. Next slide, please. I apologize for the echo. I have no idea why. Let me try and toggle the audio. Is that any better? I can't hear you now, but you may be able to. Can you wave if that's better? We're actually fine, Simon. You weren't hearing any, any echo. Okay, sorry. I was, yeah, okay. When I try and take the audio out from me, it takes me all out. Okay, I'm trying to, apologies for the feedback. I don't know quite why it's happening. Is that any better? I've just lowered the volume from the room. Okay. I think the issue maybe those that are remote, because we can hear you fine here in the room. Okay. Okay, in that case, I apologize remotely. Um, okay, so this is a, this is to expand on that CC example. One of the fun um, one of the fun things we get to, to play with in ARM is that well, our targets can be many and varied uh, in, in architecture from sort of you know major major scale cloud servers down to quite small things. So in looking at the uh, design of, of of CCA attestation, essentially things came down initially to two logical parts of the token and these are formed as each independent um as each token and the the simplest form um which is you round trip to a hardware rot every time um and get it and get something signed but then you're because we have different components uh, in charge of this then what we would do is it was would pass um a hash of of uh, of one object to the other as a challenge and effectively get everything signed in that way. Um, and that fits quite nicely with, with Deb. However, if you're in a cloud server, that's, that model doesn't work very well. You end up with, with nasty um, potential for bottlenecks. So we wanted to cache the, the platform key uh, and sign it with a key that uh, is created uh, at various intervals uh, in, the, in the workload uh, object. And then suddenly the whole format even though your your individual tokens um, don't really change, you your your whole format has to change because in now now you have a different top level signer and it, and it has to go into a top one, into in into a sub -mod. Um and there are there's potentially other pieces of work in the future which might introduce additional tokens. So this was this is kind of nasty because you then now have lots more code in places you don't want lots more code, whereas we actually wanted to be able to just take each of these, process each of these um, uh, tokens uh, independently uh, in, a, in a reference design. So instead of having to fully reformat the tokens, if each of these um, elements is, 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 is a, each, each of these is an element in a collection, they have no logical top level signer, but they have uh, independent um, uh, uh, integrity and they have a cross um, element integrity, uh, then they can exist in the collection. So next slide, please. So the collection um, format is, is pretty straightforward. It's a tagged map, contains an optional um, profile claim, which enables you to identify the nature of the, of the collection. And then one or more entries and within those entries, those are the your normal um, uh, CWTs, CWTs, etc. Um, and they can have their tags to uh, be the meaningful within the profile. 
And as I say, the this only works uh, if your security is 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 custom defined, so that the uh, integrity of each of the elements can be identified, and then integrity relationship is there, and that can be either one to one or you know, in a in a chain style or one to or one to many. But we think this gives um, uh, a lot of flexibility for for this kind of scenario. Uh, uh, next slide, please. Uh, so draft zero zero went to working group. I've had various uh, comments back. Um, the zero one went out addre addressing a, a few minor comments, um, and I've had some um, uh, ex uh, comments, um, more feedback, uh, which was in, in things like you know please emphasise the security considerations um, and allowing for things like one plus member. Uh, and that is it. So I am actually, you know, what I didn't put in here is I would like to um, pursue this for, for adoption, but I'm most interested in comments and review. And that was it. Thomas, you're in the queue. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Oh, hey Simon, just to be to, to to check this with you, you you would need a new uh, media type as well, right? Because this is top level. Indeed, I have I have I have wrote that down during your presentation. <laughs> okay. <laughs> cool. <laughs> Cheers. Yeah. So I've uh, spent some time looking at this. And just a couple of comments that I've made. I'm not sure I made them publicly, but I'll make them publicly now. One of these is that uh, you know I looked at um, whether eat sub mods or the eat deb could address the things, the the issues that are listed here, and I think they actually cannot. So it did bring up some some shortcomings in the way, you know, the constructs that are, are in the eat draft now. Um, so. From that point of view, yeah, there's some stuff that that uh, eats not handling in terms of you know kind of more complicated uh, uh, nesting and and uh, you know aggregation of tokens. Um, one of the use cases that I understand here is uh, that I think uh, Simon didn't go into is um, kind of nested uh, tokens where. You know, one token is kind of attesting to the to the next token. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's similar to dice, the way the way right. dice works. I'm, I'm not deeply familiar with that, but that was clearly something that is not handled well by eat sub mods. Um, and I, I, to me, there, there seemed like there was an interesting opportunity there to define some sort of new kind of sub mod or some some new kind of nesting scheme um, for uh, tokens that to sort of mirror what dice does <laughs> in eat. I didn't want to do that in eat because we we've, we've got enough work in eat. But um, anyway, that that's just a comment uh, on on that. Uh, there, I'm not really having a strong opinion one way or another or the other on this, but just stating there's some clearly some some areas that eat is not addressing in this in this, in this area. So I have to admit I haven't been tracking this recently, but I Show of hands, who previewed the document? Anybody in, in the chat remote? Sorry. Okay, yes, Tom. Okay, so um, we we can do uh, solicit more reviews and pull some features interest, and then we can talk about adoption. Thank you very much. Thanks, Simon. Well, I, I have to thank for for the second round of presenters for staying right on time because we now have twenty minutes of, of open mix. 
Kathleen Moriarty, I just wanted to uh, mention that the attestation set draft is not dead. Uh, somebody else is beginning to help work on it. So there should be a new revision sometime between meetings. The attestation set. Attestation, attestation set. Now I wanted to come back to the point that Hank made earlier at the mic, which came up at the hackathon about uh, so the topic here is uh, freshness mechanisms in a registry. Okay, so the context is that in the TEAP protocol, the TEAP protocol is one that can accommodate multiple freshness mechanisms. In other words, whether you're going to use, say, the nonce claim or the timestamp claim, right? That can be negotiated. So the protocol lets you actually negotiate that, and then you use that with your uh, eats or whatever, whichever one it does. And so anytime that you have capability negotiation, you need an identifier to say what the thing is that you're negotiating. Okay. So currently, the posted version of the TEAP protocol spec defines a registry that has currently three values, although you could argue whether that's the right number, maybe she only have two, four, whatever, that says uh, nonce, timestamp, and epic ID, although epic ID is not really well defined yet, right? So that's why you could argue maybe that one doesn't go in the registry yet, okay? I ended in an early review and said, okay, what page should we put this on in the protocol registry? Because okay, there isn't a page for like TEAP parameters or whatever, should they create another one? And so that begged this question of, is TEAP really the only protocol that might be negotiating precious mechanisms? Should this be on a TEEP page? Should it be on a RATS page? And so if it should be on a RATS page that says, here's any protocol that wants to negotiate ones, here's a registry to have identifiers in. Okay? If that goes on a RATS page, that means you probably want to mention this in a RATS protocol document. So right, Hank and I talked at the hackathon. It says, if we were going to propose this be a RATS registry, what document would we put it in? And Hank said, reference interaction models is probably the right place for it. And so that's why we wanted to bring it up here and see what the working group thinks, okay? Because if the RAS does not want to do this, we'll do it in TEAP, but that seems to me like the wrong place. And that moving this uh, registry definition into the reference interaction document was what Hank and I would prefer. So we wanted the working group's feedback on that. Somebody had a thought about it. Um, okay, so since you're referencing it as a claim, see the value in the rat. Um, reference, sorry. Yeah, the freshness mechanism is, you know, how you do in, uh, say, in an eat, for example, do you use the, what is it, the IAT or whatever it is, it's the name of the claim for a timestamp, and nonce is the name of the claim for the nonce, and so on. It says, which one of those am I going to be using, right? right? Now, you could argue, which I'll argue against, to say you could put that as part of the eat profile, okay? And say you have one profile that uses timestamps and a different profile that uses um, uh, you know, nonces and they're a required claim in two different profiles, okay? as opposed to a single profile where they're both in the optional claims and you must use one or the other and the profile says that. Okay? But that's how e-profile is defined right now. So you've got to use one or the other or whatever uh, based on whatever you negotiate, but they're both optional because you've got to have one of them, but neither of them is mandatory. Right? And this gets to Lawrence's point that says maybe not shouldn't be mandatory, that should be optional, and I gave him a big thumbs up says yes, because we can negotiate use of timestamp instead of, of that. But the rationale to not put it in mandatory in the profile is that this is only one of many different axes in the profile. We don't want to blow out and have an explosion of number of profiles because it varies by freshness mechanism and varies by this and varies by that and so on. It says really it should be an orthogonal parameter and a different numbering space, not part of the, of the um, OID or URI that's the profile definition. Okay, so I'm, if, if I were to summarize your, your question is that the notion of freshness has more value than just inside of TEEP. It's the notion of you could bring it in for RATS. Uh, the proposal is to put it in the reference interaction model draft, which I think is fine. Um, so my suggestion would be to kickstart that discussion in the mail list and work towards putting that as a proposal and just inserting it into the draft and uh, with your feedback that way. Okay. Yeah, I just want to bring it up here to make sure nobody said that is a really bad idea. That should stay out of scope for rats or whatever. It sounds like there would be uh, no objections that people are coming up with right now to doing that, right? We can put it on the list or whatever, but it means we could go ahead and put it into the document as part of, you know, the, the, the document review process. Yeah. 
uh, of that. So. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, 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 because this will remove text out of the T protocol document, enabling the T protocol document itself to progress faster through the review process. So, all right, thanks. Uh, working group chairs have been asked to remind everyone that the only exception to not wearing a mask in the room is if you are presenting. So if you're up at the mic or you're sitting down, keep a mask on this week. Thank you. Can I do it? Or no? No. Oh, okay. All right. No, no, no. You have to. No. You know, That's what I just said. If you're here, if you're here. Oh, okay. I can do it. What is the rule? Yeah. Okay. Only present. Not <laughs> ah, okay. That makes sense. Yeah. I apologize. Yeah, uh, Gary Monday, I'm going to comment more, uh, back on Dave and Hank's earlier suggestion. First off, uh, protocol. So, uh, right now with the each draft, there are three freshness mechanisms defined. There's the nonce, there's the CTI, and then there's the IAT issued at time. CTI is um, what they call it, 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 some sort of index. So, it, and the thing is, is that if we define it with the rats, there are other specifications, like for instance, the FIDO fi fi device onboard specification that use CWT in more broader context than attestation. So that's what I would be concerned about. The other thing is when you talk about registries, registries can be uh, in theory extensible and the each spec, I don't see any reason to expand beyond the three freshness mechanisms that are, that are already there. So just to, just want to make sure that that understanding is coming. Okay, Lawrence and then Hank. Yeah, so, uh, uh, so, so the, I, I, I don't know, I have a strong opinion one way or the other, but a, a few questions. Um, uh, one question is, if I, I didn't think that the number of freshness mechanisms was that open-ended, like there isn't really more than a few, two or three, so why do we need a registry? Um, okay. Um, the other thing is, um, why are we why are we negotiating freshness mechanisms but not negotiating crypto algorithms yeah. or or something else? Okay, so maybe so there's maybe a, a basic uh, interaction model here, like you know, particularly with eat, there's definitely no negotiation there. Like Jose, there's no negotiation there. So, uh, but I, so okay, so, so you understand where I was going. Yeah. So just to answer, in the T protocol, it negotiates both cipher suites and freshness mechanisms and the handshake. So one side says, here's my supported set of freshness mechanisms, often just one, right? And here's my set of Cypher suites. And then in the response, it can then include say, an attestation payload, which could be evidence or could be attestation results if it's in the uh, passport model, right? Um, okay, so on the question of um, other additional ones besides those three, and this gets to the question of um, the reference interaction models document is technically not eat specific and technically neither is the rats architecture right and that is because it accommodates proprietary formats right at the t-packathon table we had people using a proprietary attestation format meaning sgx reports okay sgx reports don't use suit or eat claims at all do they have a freshness mechanism sure okay it's a proprietary one that's existed for a long time right arm probably has one too that exists in their already deployed um, attestation mechanism and so the nonce claim, for example, has a specific set of byte size ranges, right? It must be between, I don't remember what it is, eight and 64 bytes or something like that, right? So you can imagine somebody that says, well, I've got a six byte one or a 60, you know, a 72 byte one or whatever. Therefore, it's not the same thing as what nonce would be registered as because that means a nonce claim. You could argue that that needs a different freshness mechanism number in the registry. And so somebody like a vendor, like Intel or ARM, should be allowed to register a freshness mechanism that's the one that they're already using. Okay, so there might be three standard ones, 
or whatever the number is, two, four. And there could be vendor specific ones for things that are already deployed that are in use right now. So that's why it would be a registry. Sorry, just to, to jump the queue, but briefly, uh, I think there is a bit of a negotiation mo uh, thing for ETH through profiles, as Thomas showed in his uh, 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 media types thing. Hi, this is Hank. Um, so the, maybe probably, I don't know, closing remarks on this topic. Um, the uh, interaction models basically are flavors of these freshness um, characteristics that we have. And so that's why we put it in there because to differentiate those. And I think, again, as uh, Dave already highlighted, there are existing solutions that will benefit from classification like that, and they can easily tailor it around them. And uh, yeah, I heard that, especially for the Epoch ID, for example. Um, yeah. Any other comments, issues? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Hank, Hank is topic. putting himself on the queue. So come on. Yeah. Totally a different topic, open mic topic. I'm not going there. Um, we did not provide an update on the DAA ID, but uh, we just recently initiated by Dave had an internal review round on comments on, on, specific, on, on inconsistency in the text. So uh, that's why we did not uh, provide an update today. Uh, there's a working on this, and uh, I think we are pretty close uh, to getting a work first working group last call. Um, but uh, but let's find out. Okay, we have to do this internal round. We have to go to the list, get get the questions out there again. Uh, look, that's look fine to you. And if that is somehow stable, I think maybe before November we can we can call. But but uh, again, I wanted to just give a small update on DAA. It was not worth a slide. So yeah, but we are working on this. <laughs> Okay, so um, to recap from today, uh, the device description draft will do an early uh, yeah, review. The um, is it AR forty R R forty draft? You're waiting for closure on the E draft. Um, e media types will do a call for adoption. Same thing for the forum draft. Um, we'll do a call for interest on the DA source call. And uh, shoot, the last one, Simon, I think that's the right guy's name. Simon's draft will also do a call for interest. And, and then uh, the chairs need to reconvene we need to go through the remaining eight issues and see which ones are the main factors that may or may not hold up the working group last call because otherwise it's kind of useless. So, um, and then Gary and, and Laura can, can stick around since we're only early call here. Um, we want to Hi, this is Roman, and I think we also said that if we needed one, we would do an interim meeting, right, Kathy? Yeah, yeah I, I think you were saying yeah. excellent. Sorry if I wasn't clear. Okay, I think with that, we can adjourn. Can you guys spread a minute back? Thank you. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Uh, uh, on the architecture document, our goal is to post it before the end of the week and get Roman to act before the end of, before we leave Philadelphia. So. Okay. Uh,